We need to know this. We talked about this a lot last week. We're hitting it again this week. So many times I've heard people, and you, I know you've heard this before, where people say they're suffering because I, I must be outside of God's will. As if, if you're suffering, that would not be God's will for you. Or I've heard people say, whatever suffering you're going through is not God's will for you. They would liken God's plan to your life like a plane taking off from Seattle and going to Oklahoma. That's where when we jump on a plane to go visit my wife's parents, there's a great flight, Alaska Airlines, it's direct, no stops, no anything. We get in on, we, we get on out Seattle, and we get off in Oklahoma City. It's a perfect flight. Yet, many would then say, well, God's plan for your life is like that plane, and yet there's hijackers on it. And at some point in the flight, they take over the plane, and they reroute the plane, and now it goes outside the United States to some foreign land with no extradition policy. Right? And we're like, well, I guess God's plans have been thwarted. I guess they've been hijacked. God didn't want you, but he wasn't going to stop things from happening. It just happened. But what we see throughout God's word, and especially here in the book of Job, Satan cannot hijack the plans of God. In fact, at the end of the book, Job 42, 2, you should memorize this verse. This is one of those verses you need to know. Job will say, I know that you can do all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Isn't that good news? It's hard news in many ways, because that means the things that are in your life, God's not absent from, but God is actually using and ordaining and yet, it is good news knowing that Satan's not running rampant in your life. Chaos is not just free to do whatever it's like, or whatever it would like. But yet, in some mysterious way, God is sovereign over every circumstance that comes your way. And what's hard about that is that that brings up questions, right? Like, we want to know, so, well, well, what about this, or what about this? We have a lot of questions that then the Bible does not always answer in the way that we want, at least. But denying God's sovereignty over pain and over suffering does not somehow like, like make those questions go away. It doesn't answer those questions. In fact, I would say to deny his sovereignty just raises a whole lot more questions, much more problematic questions, like... How can an infinitely all-powerful God be worthy of all worship and honor and yet not be sovereign over the darkest nights in your soul? That, to me, is a lot scarier than thinking God's just absent altogether or he had no way to stop or prevent whatever's coming into your life. Now, last week, um, before that, what's interesting in the book of Job is that this one book wrestles so radically with the relationship between God, suffering, and evil. Like hardly any other book wrestles so much with these topics than the book of Job. And yet not once by Job or by any of the comforters is the sovereignty of God questioned. Do you realize that? Like just, just think through that for a moment. Not once in 42 chapters of the book that most intensely wrestles with suffering, pain, evil, and how God rules, or never once is God's sovereignty questioned. Not once does the comforter say, well, you know, Job, I mean, God wasn't around when this happened. Not once is that thought ever brought in to this book. Now, last week, we looked six ways from chapters one and two on, on how God is ultimately responsible be, behind all things that happened to Job. But today, I, I want to just come at it from a little bit different angle, and I want to look at, from another chapter in the Bible, how God's providence stretches over evil and suffering, over the darkest nights that we see. And so, Psalm 88 is probably the other darkest chapter in the entire Bible, and I would say it's second darkest. I think Job 3 might be a little darker. I do think so. But I, I just want to read a few verses, like verses 3 through 7. I encourage you later tonight, read all of Psalm 88. But here, here we go. So this is, this is what the psalmist is feeling. He says, for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. 
I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that, are, that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. Do you hear the agony in him? He's like, I'm just cut off. He then says, you, you, God, have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep, your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. Clearly, the psalmist is in absolute agony. He sees death drawing near like a boat, coming to shore. He's getting closer and closer and closer. That's how he sees death. But according to verse 6, according to verse 6, who puts him in the pit? This is our interactive time. Again, we need an interactive slide like Adiel. we got to jump on that. So who puts him in the pit? God does. Who, whose wrath is against him, according to verse 7? Who's bombarding him with waves? Who's inspiring this guy to write? While we don't always understand why God does what he does, or how suffering is ultimately for God's glory, or our good, like those are just, that's a mystery, right? Maybe we wrestle with that, but that's at the reality of where we live. We always rest in absolute confidence that God's plans have not been thwarted. So when darkness comes and it settles upon your soul, like just a deep, thick cloud, you can reach your hand out and your hand just disappears and you can't see it because there's so much blackness all around you. What we learn in Job, what we learn throughout the whole Bible is that when darkness settles upon Upon your soul, God has not abandoned you or forgotten you. Your restlessness is not the result of God resting and taking a nap. He didn't take a break of ruling the world at that moment. So know this, at every moment in your life, in the good and the bad, God is working for your good. This is precisely why. So Romans 8, the end of Romans ends with this whole argument. In fact, Romans 8, 35, this is, Paul is, is making this same argument right here. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? I mean, he, he just walked through the entire gospel. He tells them how secure they are in Christ. And now he wants to say, what if, what if you now experience famine? What if you experience darkness of the soul? What if you experience tribulation? What if you experience distress or persecution or nakedness? Or, you, or somebody comes at you with the sword, like the Roman government at that time. Are you separated from the love of Christ then? Has God abandoned you? Paul's point is no. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the good news that we have in the gospel.